This is the Beyond Barriers Unscripted Podcast. I learned that about myself, that I really enjoyed competition. Hello and welcome. My name is Randy Owen, and in this episode, we meet Janice Walls. Now, Janice is a member of the board of directors at Society for the Blind. She was also featured last year in a uh, local PBS documentary called Life After Sight. Um, I'll make sure that I go ahead and leave a a link to that documentary in the show notes. Um, Before we get to the conversation, I'd like to ask that if you enjoy the show, to please consider sharing with a friend. Uh, Hit the like button and also please subscribe. Uh, if you got any ideas, questions, or comments for the show, my name is Randy Owen, and you can email me at bb.unscripted at gmail.com. And now, my conversation with Janice. I do know that you're a member of the Board of Directors at Society for the Blind. I know that last year you were featured on a PBS documentary called Life After Sight, Um I know that you're into archery, you're, that you've actually competed at national and international uh, levels. Um, other than those, because I want to get around to talking about those, is there anything that you would like the listener to know about you? Um, well, um, yes, uh, I, I am on the board of directors of Society for the Blind. Um, and yes, we have met. Um, I was having trouble with JAWS, my screen reader, and um, I believe it was Google Chrome that I was struggling with. And I came in uh, to your office and you helped me work work on that. I brought my laptop and, and you helped me with that. Um, uh, otherwise, the only time I've ever met you is, is at board meetings when you've um, had a presentation. Um, and you uh, um, uh, other, other than yeah, that, yes, we haven't um, spent much time, but I know you well from your reputation. <laughs> um, and as far as <laughs> anything else, um, know about me, um, not in particular, um, I've, I've been legally blind. I, I was born legally blind, um, and I lost most of my sight probably, uh, 20, 20 years ago. Um, was when it it pretty much all all went away. I have retinitis pigmentosa, and um, and I but it's not your typical uh, retinitis pigmentosa that you hear about, where people have uh, relatively normal vision for probably the first fifteen twenty years or more of their life, and then they start to notice change and start to lose their um, sight. Mine, I, I always was legally blind um, with correction. And then it started to pro- progress when I became an adult. Um, just a question, you know, I grew up identifying as legally blind. I have um, rod cone dystrophy and I've developed keratoconus as, as I, you know, in my late 20s. And I always, you know, people would ask, and I would say it was legally blind. And I always felt like I had to explain it, you know? Um, the other thing is, is I never really knew any other folks with visual impairment um, growing up. And it wasn't really until I, you know, started working at Society for the Blind that I, I started to, you know, kind of feel at home with myself, you know? Have you had a, a similar experience? Uh, yes, d- definitely a sim- similar experience. Um, my older brother and I both are uh, visually impaired. My brother's vision was uh, a little bit worse than mine from the start. And my younger brother and sister have no, no visual impairments. Um, and there is nobody else in my family, uh, cousins, grandparents, uncles, that has what my brother and I have. So we don't know, you know, where where it came from, how it happened. Um, we were both mainstreamed in school, um, and we had uh, a visually impaired instructor who we saw outside of 
class, you know, the classroom setting that we would, we would see her. I don't know how, because it changed depending on what our needs were. You know, um, I read large print because I could see it. Um, and my brother learned Braille because he wasn't able to, um, see, to manage the large print. Um, as far as identifying, the funny thing is, is um, growing up, I did not identify as being a person that was visually impaired uh, or, or blind. Um, in school, you know, it was not, it wasn't easy being different. You didn't want to be different. Uh, you know, and the kids didn't, don't, kids don't like kids that are different, <laughs> especially if they get extra help. So it's, I feel like I did everything I could to, um, to be like them. And of course my large print books and my, uh, the lamp for extra lighting on my desk and my dark felt pens and my dark, you know, number four pencils and my dark lined paper you can't get away from all that, right? <laughs> um, but aside from that, out on the playground, you know, I just, I tried to be like everybody else. So I didn't I identify as that. Plus the fact that when we were at home, my brother and I, we were not different than anybody else. We were equal. I, and we were, we were never um, made to feel like we were blind or visually impaired and weren't, there was anything that we weren't able to do. That, that was never an issue at home. We were always encouraged to do, um, you know, what everybody else did. Chores, um, you know, you did your homework, you went outside and you played, you rode a bike, you tried skating, you, you know, we weren't, my dad taught us to water ski when we were eight years old. That's awesome. Um, and so, you know, so, and so it was quite a contrast going between home life where you weren't different than your other brothers and sisters or your cousins. You weren't treated differently to going to school and trying to fight to not be treated differently, you know? And um, so I'll never forget, I was probably in, I don't know, I was probably in sixth grade or fifth grade, and a boy said to me on the playground, are you blind? And it shocked me because no one had ever asked me that before, and nobody had ever said that to me. And I said no. And when I went home and I told my mom he said that, and she says, well, you should have said yes because you are you are blind. You, you're legally blind. And I was like, that just shocked me. I'd never been labeled before. And then I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity. And this is the kids thinking, you know, well, that sure. was kind of a missed opportunity because now maybe the kids, the bullies, the resentment wouldn't have been there so much if I had just said, yes, I'm blind, you know, because now they would have, they, maybe they're, resentment or their bullying would have been replaced by pity, you know, who knows, but maybe, you know, in my mind, shoot, I, if I would have said that, maybe they would have not been so mean um, and would have been nicer. Um, so I, I, that was kind of a, a, a memory that I have that I um, have always remembered that, that point and, you know, that where, where I, a reality, you know, kind of like a percept, what do they call that? A paradigm shift. Um, but even after that and into, you know, high school, I got contact lenses. So, you know, I no longer had the, the large, yeah, so I yep. no, no oh, longer yes. had the magnification, um, you know, the, the, the big, you know, the big, the, you know, the big eyes, the glasses, you know, um, and so, uh, and then, you know, college and, you know, when I fought using a cane, I did not, I, I learned to use a cane but I did not want to use a cane because I just didn't identify with being um, blind. And I wanted to do everything to, I could to look normal. And so even in college, I did everything that I could. I memorized, you know, the, the steps where I had to go, you know, and I, I was very good at, um, what do you call that? Uh, 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 
you know, mobility? like problem solving or, um, well, no, I mean, you know how, when you, um, you compensate for a, uh, you know, for some, for something, you, you become very good at compensating, like, you know, really reading the shadows and those are stairs or remembering there's stairs there, you know, that type of thing so that you don't need a cane. Um, and, you know, so I was, I was pretty good at that. But once again, that kind of attitude that I had did not necessarily benefit me because now I had to be an advocate for myself in college, you know, and saying that I did, I still needed large print books. I still couldn't read the, the uh, blackboard. Um, and so I needed things and I had to advocate for myself now, not through, not my teachers you know, weren't doing it anymore. Uh, so with the teachers to get this, you know, the, the accommodations that I needed. Um, so, you know, here you're, you're trying to pretend like you can see like, you know, like that you're like everybody else, but you do need certain accommodations. Um, and so that's, and I know I rode a bike. They had a handicap set. They called it a handicap center in those days at the college. And one of the services they provided was um, a bus to pick up, the students from um, from home, because you know you didn't have transportation. Well, I know this one um, this bus driver that was was on my route. I, she was very resentful of me, and I think it's because I was young and I was, you know, I was pretty. I, I you know I guess I was pretty, and I and I didn't appear to have a a disability, but I I was definitely legally blind. But I compensated for it you know and so you know she didn't really like me much and you know so <laughs> you know it's a it's a what do they call that a double-edged sword you know when you're trying when I really began to identify as a blind person because I got a you know I, I graduated from college and I went into the medical transcription field and I wound up um working, uh, I, I wound up being, uh, supervising the department, um, uh, at a hospital, it was a hospital and medical group. And, um, you know, and I, and I got my technology, my first time I got the, uh, what we called uh, the CCTV that really helped me and, and technology really started to, to grow for us adaptive technology in the eighties and, and into the nineties. Um, how did it, how did it and, feel like having to hide it, having, uh, having to pretend like you couldn't see, how did that feel? Was it a relief? It, it was because I wanted people to treat me like they treated everybody else. And I wanted to fit into society to me because I had not grown up. Uh, there were very few visually impaired kids that I grew up with. It was only on special occasions that I might get together with the group from the um, school district, there was a small group of visually impaired kids. Um, and let me just backtrack really quickly. In junior high, there was a there was summer school for the visually impaired students in the district, um, and this was in seventh grade and eighth grade summer school. That was like heaven because now I was I didn't have to put on that facade anymore and I could yeah. be around other kids that were visually impaired and it really it was such a great experience um being around other kids like me and not having to prove anything and then you go back to the other environment and it's very it is very stressful because you're always on guard and but you know I put I put that on myself but that was I felt that in order to be accepted in society, in my community, um, that, that I needed to do that. Um, and because I, on the outside world, you know, and especially when you go looking for a job, the first thing that comes out of people's mouth is how can you, how can you do this job if you can't see? Right. Um, and it's very hard to get that first job um, because, uh, you know, like when I was trying to get my first job, I didn't have a, a CCTV, which is the equipment that I was going to need in order to do my job, but you have to tell the employer, I will, and I brought the uh, the pamphlet with me that showed the equipment that I would be, be able to get if I got a job. And so I said, you know, so I would tell him and I would show him, this is what I will use 
to do the job if, but I don't have this right now until, not until I get the job, you know? <laughs> and so, right. um, but you know, so yeah, it's just, that just kind of was always there that, um, that you need, you need to fit in. We don't adapt to you. You need to, you need to adapt to us. That, that just is, is how it was. Can you remember something in life that was maybe an aha moment? I think that my aha moment that, hey, you're going to have to, you know, rethink this and you're going you're going to have to deal with the fact that you're visually impaired is when I was working at the hospital um, and I was about I was probably 30, probably uh, 29, 30 years old. And I would um, walk down the hall at the hospital to either deliver um, reports or to go, you know, to the cafeteria, wherever I was walking at the long hallway. Well, all of a sudden I realized I was coming so close to running into people because they could, they had no reason to know that I couldn't see. I, like I said, I wore contact lenses, you know, I, I didn't use a cane. And I'm walking down the hall and uh, I, all of a sudden I would notice in my field of vision that there's somebody, they just were so close and they just passed me. And I thought, you know what? That's not right. If I run into somebody, they're going to be upset. They're going to be mad potentially. And for a good reason, because they're, they have no reason to know that I can't see them. And that's going to happen. I'm going to run into them. Um, and I'm not going to have any good excuse for doing that. And they could be hurt. I could be hurt or, or they could just be upset with me, which I, d- you know, didn't want that. I thought you got to, at least if you're not going to use that cane, you got to hold, you know, hold it. Um, so that as an identification that you, you can't see them. And that was the first time that I used a cane in started using a cane in public other than with mobility instruction, because I had plenty of mobility instruction in instructors and stuff. But um, that's the first time I ever started what that I started using it. And it really was very liberating um, to not have that burden anymore. It just to have it there. Okay. Yeah. I have a vision problem, you know, and it's now it's, it's out there for everybody to see. And it was, kind of a a relief. Now, the thing about the cane for me is I never liked the attention that it, I felt that it brought to me um, of um, tap, tap, tapping and encountering the object that you want to avoid, avoid. And so there's Janice going down the hall, going through the lobby. Oh yeah, she found the chair. You know, I mean that in my mind, I never ever liked that, that attention that it brought to me. And plus when you're walking down a sidewalk and you want to just walk with the, with the people and they part the ways, like it's the Red Sea, you know, and all, you're, all of a sudden you're alone. I felt like that cane isolated me from people. They don't know how to talk to you. And I'm not speaking for everybody. I'm, this is, these are my experiences and my, you know, impressions um, um, beginning to use it. I felt like it isolated me. People didn't want to talk to me. Um, and they, you know, they wanted to get out of my way because they don't want to be hit by it. And then, you know, they would know exactly where I was going. And so I, I, um, you know, I, I, I held it, but I didn't necessarily um, use it. Um, and the, the the when I got my first guide dog was when I really came to terms with my vision impairment and identifying, um, you know, as a person who is blind. Because when you have a guide dog, there is no, you know, that's that there. There's no hiding it anymore. You don't put the dog away. You use the dog. But they do draw a certain amount of attention. And it's good attention. It's good attention, not negative attention. A guide dog, yes. People want to talk to you. People want to be close to you. They don't avoid you anymore. And um, and it's an icebreaker. And if you need help, you know that a person's gonna uh, gonna be there because you've got the dog. Um, and so 
there's, it's just, it's totally different um, with a dog. And so now I could identify and I could not feel um, negative, negative feelings about being blind because I, I had this dog and that was a positive thing. And so then, uh, and then just at that time, I became involved with a, a group down in, and this is all down in, I grew up in Southern California, um, a group called New Vision um, that I just happened to stumble upon. And it was a group of people um, who were blind and visually impaired, and they created this social um, club uh, for geared towards people who are blind and visually impaired and not excluding sighted people at all. We had sighted people in the class, in, I mean, in the club, but it was a, um, we all wanted to have different experiences, do social things <clears throat> and, and get togethers. And it's just that camaraderie of, of being all, you know, having a common thing of this, um, you know, blindness or, or visual impairment and be able to all get together and, um, uh, uh, socialize with each other and do um, recreational things together. We went to Laughlin twice a year. We took the bus. We scheduled that, you know, and all, all these, you know, blind people, you know, invade Laughlin. And it was, it really taught me to to embrace being blind and it could be a fun thing and not a, not a negative thing. Do you feel it was important to include sighted people? Yes. Yes. Because we learn from each other. And it's, there are things that, that we need help. We need that things, um, it, that makes, it makes it easier if you've got a sighted person there uh, with safety reasons or um, technology wasn't so, so great back then, you know, uh, so, you know, for, uh, but, but yes, and just because the, um, you know, kind of like at Society for the Blind, where you've got, 50% of the staff is uh, blind or visually impaired and, you know, and the rest are sighted and it's a, it couldn't be anything but a positive um, experience for, for everybody. Um, yeah. I, I kind of, you know, it's, I've been asked, you know, I run the music group down there and I've been asked, you know, well, if we're mm -hmm. sighted, can we come down and play? It's like, if you're a musician, please just come and play. I, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> um, I think, you know, teaching, um, segregation once again that's the last yeah. thing that we yeah we want, want. inclusion right so why would we, mm -hmm, we deny mm -hmm. that to somebody else exactly and you know um i think on on pat duffy's podcast he mentioned that that he i thought that was very interesting that he mentioned that he'd never experienced a group of people so inclusive of other people that he he never felt as a sighted person excluded from the blind people. And I, I, I think that's very true. There are other, um, you know, other groupings of people that might not be so welcoming to, to everybody, you know, that you feel like you have a culture, you know, cause they always talk about, is there a blind culture? Um, which I think there, there is to an extent, but I think blind people, people who are visually impaired want, we want to be part of the world. And you can't be part of the world if you're going to um, exclude the majority of the world, you know? Um, yeah. We want, we want to be part of, of life and life includes people who can see. <laughs> you, how long have you been on the board of directors? Uh, since 2013. So, and, and I'm just, as I listen to you, uh, you know, and you refer back to Pat Duffy and I kind of see a commonality and you've worked in service, being of service to others. Is that important to you? And if so, why? It is, it is important to me um, because I, hmm, um, that's a good question as to why. I it, I feel like I've always been drawn to that for whatever reason. Um, honestly, there was a time, uh, a, a few times in my life that I thought I wanted to be a nun. Um, and I was really drawn to that idea, and it and it all goes around that service thing. 
I think. And I, and I thought that I, and a community, you know, I, I always wanted to be part of a community, um, which I haven't always been part of a community, but I think it's, I think it sounds wonderful to be part of a community. Um, and so, uh, I, I, I was drawn to the, you know, the religious life, um, at, at different points in my life. And, um, but yes, um, after I got out of medical transcription, um, I went back to school and I, at, at first I wanted to do tech support. Um, because I love technology. I, I've always loved technology. I, I pick up on it pretty good. I, I don't feel that I'm very up to date anymore because I don't have to be right now. And so I, I'm, but I can, I can pick up and I, I can learn technology, um, pretty quickly, um, because I, I like it. I enjoy it. And so that's what I was going to do. And I went back to school. Um, and then when I moved up here to, um, to Lodi, uh, and got married up here and I started going to the community college up here and I started working with the, um, adaptive technology center, the, the gentleman who was the, um, the head of that, uh, that adaptive technology classroom. And he set it all up and he, he was so innovative and forward thinking. And he kind of took me under his wing and he really he in, encouraged me to um, to work with the students, the 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 blind visually impaired students, and the technology, as well as the other students with other um, learning disabilities. And he really encouraged me to go back and get my bachelor's degree because that was something that I never even considered that I would be able to ever do is is get a bachelor's degree. That and he said he told me that I was already doing bachelor's work. And there wasn't any reason I couldn't. And he and he really was my mentor. And all that time working in that classroom and learning about the different people and their experiences and and mostly wrapped around learning technology um, and the ability to read, to re be a fluent reader um, and using technology to to be a fluent reader um, was so exciting exciting and innovative and he and i presented at um a couple um csun conferences right regarding um uh adaptive technology well my, i got my bachelor's degree in adaptive technology for adults with disabilities and um and we presented on reading fluency using a screen reader how how to have a we we designed a program a, not a not a computer program but a you know, a, a, like a curriculum for teaching reading fluency. And we, I also came up with, in the course of working with the visually impaired and blind students, teaching, I helped, uh, I was an aide in the class that was teaching JAWS. And I noticed that, and I, I went to, his name was Ted Wattenberg, uh, amazing person. He still, uh, he works for the Sacramento School District now. But I went to him and I said, Ted, I, I don't understand why the students, they seem to get stuck. They, they get to a certain level learning JAWS and then they can't progress. They just, they're not getting it. I, I don't, I, and I'm not, I'm not sure why they, they don't seem to, to get it. I said, but you know, I guess it's not my problem. You know, if they, you know, he says, well, actually it is your problem. He says, yep. if you're, if you're a teacher, it is your problem and it's something you, you have to figure out. And I thought, hmm, okay. And he said, so he made me, you know, we brainstormed and what do you think the problem is? I said, you know, I think the biggest problem is that computers and the, you know, the, the windows system, because DOS was, <laughs> we're going way back when you talked about DOS. Yeah. I remember, I remember and, DOS. Yes. And I learned, um, you know, I learned to use a computer with DOS and it, it, that was pretty, pretty simple, pretty basic, it, you know, easy to teach. Yeah. Now you got windows and it's, it's all graphical. And I said, I think the problem is, is that it's not tangible. And you're talking about all these things, these buttons and links and icons, and you've got, um, and this was back in the windows, you know, the early stages, what windows 95 or 98 or whatever, you know, um, I avoided computers and, at that time because of this. 
I had the hardest time switching over from at the in the in the uh, mid uh, the late nineties. Um, I went from Zoom text. I was using Zoom text with um, Vocalize at the time um, with dots, and because so I could see it enlarged and hear it at the same time because I needed the reinforcement of the hearing. But switch. Then we went to Windows at my um, uh, at work, and the colors and the you know the the contrast. I just, I couldn't do it, and I and so I had to switch. No. And so I had to switch to just, you know, just the, the, um, the screen reader. And I, I remember telling my, my brother said, um, first I tried to, to use window eyes. I think it was, yeah, window eyes. And then my brother was using jaws. So he says, you know, why don't you get jaws and get the, get the, um, the, t- this is funny, Randy, because he says this was with jaws, um, 2.8. Okay. And he says, Get the instruction cassettes, and and it, the, the the cassettes were Eric Damery and um, Ted Henter at the time. Yeah, Eric's still there, and Ted Henter is the one that that Henter Joyce. Yes, and so get the tapes and learn and listen and and just learn you know learn how to use it. And so I get the tapes, and they were so hilarious. Ted Henter and Derek Eric Damery. They would so they tell you what to do, and you've seen that. And okay, now push these buttons, and you know whatever the combination, you know the key this key combination, and this will happen. And then they demonstrate on the cassette, and they do it, and they sit there, and nothing happens. And they kind of go, <laughs> okay, well, that was interesting. Now let's see what <laughs> happened. And I thought, you know, you guys, you don't know about editing, and <laughs> you know maybe. It was so funny because they had all the, the bloopers were still, you know, in it, but I just, I had a hard time. I still had a hard time. And I told my brother, I just want to throw this computer out the window. I, I said, I don't know what's wrong. It coincidentally that year I went to CSUN cause I would always go to CSUN living down in Southern California um, for that. The Friday was open to the public for the tech show. Well, I ran into Eric Damery. Oh, wow. And he was there. And I introduced myself and I said, I want to tell you, I'm trying to learn Jaws and I'm really having a hard time. I said, I love you guys. I love your tapes, but I can't, I just can't get it. I'm not, I'm just not getting it. He says, you know, I know um, I've been working on a whole new set of instructional uh, cassettes for, for teaching Jaws. And I think it was coming out for uh, Jaws 3.0 or 3.1 or something. He says, They'll be done. I'm going to be done with that. He says, give me your um, name and, and contact information, and I will send you a new set. When I get these, these cassettes all done, I'll send them to you, and you can use those, and I think you'll be able to have a better uh, time doing it. And so he did. He sent them to me, and I did. Then I, I learned. I, I was able to learn, um, you know, how to how to do it, and, uh, <laughs> and it was, um, you know, after after that. If you don't mind, I would like to change the topic a little bit, if, if you're okay. Okay. I'd like to talk about archery. You are, um, you've competed internationally uh, as well as in the United States. You've actually taken uh, rankings. Um, can you talk a little bit yeah. about that, how that came to be? And then I also noticed on your YouTube channel, I did go check it out. I uh, Is that your husband that makes the, yeah, um, yeah can the you video? talk a little bit? Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So in, um, well, when my husband and I first met, he, he and a friend started, um, they took up archery, uh, as a, as a hobby, as a, a recreational, something to do. And they really liked it. They, he really, really enjoyed it. And he started doing local, um, tournaments. And I, I would go with him, and he joined a, a club um, in Sacramento, an archery club, to go shoot with them. And he really was enjoying it. And I thought to myself, I just would like to see what it's like to um, to shoot a bow, you know, and have that arrow leave the the bow and hit the target. Just just experience what that's like. And um, so, but then I thought I thought I want to, um, but I want to see if anybody else is doing it that's blind. Uh, to see what technique they're using. 
uh, for sighting, you know, how do they, how do they sight to hit the target? So I did some internet searches. This was back in 2003 and I did internet searches for blind archers or archers who are blind. Well, of course, mostly I came up with blind, like, you know, when duck blinds, you know, like hunting, hunting blinds. It is Um, tricky on those Google searches sometimes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But the only thing that I found at that time was there was an organization and still is over in Great Britain called British Blind Sport. And they were doing archery and they had a, they, uh, they were doing it very successfully over there. And they had a technique that they had developed. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not exactly sure, but it, but it had been, they'd been doing it for quite some time. And so I wrote to them. I sent an email and I said, you know, that I was interested in starting and could they tell me what they were doing? And they sent pictures of the setup that they were using. And this setup was actually, it was um, a a sanctioned um, technique by International Blind Sports Association. So it was a legitimate technique for, for competing. So they sent the pictures and my husband replicated what they were doing. Um, over here, and basically, uh, what you need is a foot foot locator that just lays across, uh, lays on the ground. It's like a bit. Uh, it's it's not a two by four, but let's say it's a, just a two by four that lays on the ground, uh, perpendicular to the shooting line, so that you back up, back your heels up to it, and now you are straddling the shooting line and you're facing down the shooting line, okay? And the targets are to your left, all right? Because when you shoot archery, you hold the bow, you draw across your body. So if you're shooting as a right-handed, we'll just assume you're a right-handed archer. The bow is in your left hand, and you reach across your body with your right hand, and you grab the string, and you draw, you you raise the bow then on, on the left side of your body, and you draw that string in towards your face and you anchor it somewhere on your face. So now that, that bow is your arm is pointing to your left. Um, that's holding the bow and that's where the targets are. Okay. So your body faces down the shooting line, but when you're going, getting ready to shoot, you turn your head towards the target. And then, as, and then as if you're the looking position. over your left shoulder. Yes. Yes. So your, Foot locator ensures with these foot markers that stick out from them that are adjusted for your um, stance, okay, that you should be standing um, like shoulder width apart with your feet shoulder width apart. So you have a marker that you can put your heels back against so that you're always standing in the same spot. A sighted archer can see where they're putting their feet, you know, locating them, uh, um, straddling the shooting line. We can't. So that tells us where to put our feet. Then there's a tripod that's to the to the left of us at the end of that foot marker, that foot locator um, to your left, that tripod holds your tactile sight. And all that is at the top of that tripod um, is a, uh, you, you can use different things. I, um, we, we recommend for people who are, who are gonna compete that it, you can use an actual bow sight that a person would put on their bow and look through. But in the, a bow sight is adjustable up, down, left, and right easily so that you can do it as you need to um, in a competition. So, But if you have, you have something at the top, on the top of that tripod that can adjust up, down, left, and right, and it's just a, it has a, uh, a protrusion uh, that, that sticks out that you t- touch the back of your hand to, okay? So if, if your uh, feet are in the foot locator, and you're facing down the shooting line, you raise your bow to the left, your head is turned towards the targets, you're looking over your shoulder. When you raise your bow, the back of your hand is gonna touch that small, um, it could be like the head of a screw, you know, it could be what, whatever you like. So this is for uh, elevation. Yes, yeah, so that gives you your elevation and your, your what they call windage, your, you know, your left and right, so you're not pointed off to the left or right. It gives you your elevation and your, your direction to the target, okay? And so that can be adjusted for, to fine-tune it. But that's, it's very basic. It's called, it's called tactile archery, tactile sighting, because you get one, one area that you touch the back of your hand, 
um, and you've got your foot locator, so you're st always standing in the same position. The rest is all form learning to shoot the bow like everybody else shoots a bow. Um, the technique is the same for shooting a bow. And um, so so we, Courtney uh, is my husband, and he designed, so he, he built me the first innovation, and he's been improving on it um, ever since. And we now make it out of, it used to be wood, now it's um, aluminum and, you know, and, uh, and so the, so I started um, doing it just for fun and it wound up that I could do it, actually compete um, in, in, there were no categories for visually impaired archers over here in the United States. So um, I started, I asked if I could compete in California tournaments and they said yes, that I could as a guest. And then they voted uh, the board for California voted in visually impaired archery as an actual category. So I could shoot an, in my own category. And then I, we, we decided it would be fun to go to the U S nationals um, in 2006, I believe it was. And so called them and said, you know, I'm a visually impaired archer. Will you let me shoot in your tournament? Yes. They said they would. I told them exactly how it worked and, and all that. And, and um, so they made a, a category for visually impaired archer in, uh, on the national level. And so I was the first visually impaired archer ever to shoot at U.S. Nationals, right on. Um, which was pretty fun. And then the World Championships in 2007 was going to happen. It was the first time that visually impaired archery would be in the para, para archery World Championships. And so the para archery coach, because she had seen me at nationals, um, fortunately, <clears throat> she knew, you know, that I was shooting. And so she invited me to travel with the para team um, to Korea to participate in the Paralympics. Not the, it's, not the, it's not the full Paralympics, but it's the World Championships, which is a level um, under the Paralympics. So uh, that, was the, that was in 2007. Um, and I, I participated. There were six visually impaired archers at the time. And I won the silver medal at that. I mean, never intended. I mean, I was just going over like thrilled just to be part of the, the para team, right. And be experiencing something like that. Never thought that I would ever shoot in a world championships. And here I wound up <laughs> uh, getting the silver medal. So uh, it was pretty amazing. And you're um, trailblazing the way for others too, to follow. I mean, when you think about that's it, what, that's the truth. Yes. Yes, and that's what we've. There's always been two two parts to you know to to this, and for for Courtney and and for me is the enjoyment of just. I, I discovered that I love competition. That that feeling. I I really enjoy competing because I'd never been in a a competitive sport ever before. So I I learned that about myself that I really enjoy competition. Um, but the other thing is really what that sport. And the ability for a blind person to participate in that sport, what that does for um, other, you know, the, the the people around you to see a person who's blind being able to be competitive um, in that sport, that get, that gives a whole different perspective to an outsider um, of what a blind person is capable of. And other um, blind people, Courtney and I have done lots of clinics. Um, we did work with the uh, Foundation for the Junior Blind for, for quite some time and had um, kids um, work with them once a month. And we've done veterans um, uh, clinics and uh, we've done um, some things for um, wounded warriors and just the, you know, the rehabilitation aspect of it is amazing because here you're taking a sport that no blind person would ever think that they would be able to uh, participate in and showing them that they can. And so that really opens up. Yeah. And you can compete and you can compete at high levels. And uh, so it's been a, it's been a real um, challenge because it's, it's been a very slow going uh, in growing the numbers. It's very difficult um, to grow, grow that our numbers Um and get recognized by world archery and world archery has come a long way to recognizing us and trying to encourage us. Of course, COVID I'm hoping because we made great strides 
we had 17 visually impaired archers at the world championships in 2019, which was just uh, uh, amazing. That was a first. And then COVID hit. And I, and, you know, a lot of them have not been able to shoot because of um, restrictions, you know, all of, in different parts of the world. And um, so I'm just hoping that we can keep our numbers up because we want to be in the full Paralympic games, but we can't do that until we get enough people shooting it. But so that web, but my YouTube website that you're talking about, um, I have a website called seenolimits.org, um, which talks about archery for the blind. And it, it has some videos, uh, links on there. Um, and then my, my YouTube channel um, has more videos. We've made videos for people who have purchased the equipment and trying to um, uh, explain to them how you set it up, how you use it. And that's a lot of what, um, what's gone up lately because we got a, uh, an order for uh, equipment from the Chicago uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, they wanted four setups and Courtney will, will build them for people. And so we put videos for them because he made theirs a little bit different because it's a clinic setting. And so it doesn't have to be a competition um, setup. And so he made those out of PVC pipe. And so we, um, we did a, a, a series of videos explaining how to set that up so that they could, could see that. And if anybody else you know, wanted those, then those videos would be there and he would make those for them. And then other ones. And you can also, there's also um, some videos of, me shooting at competitions and, um, you know, things like that. But yeah, so Courtney, um, I, um, we, we make those very, you know, backyard, very, um, not, not professional videos, but we're just do it yourself. To <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're do it yourself. Uh, and just use my phone and upload it, you know, right from my phone, which makes it easy, but it's just to, to, so that people, when they get the equipment, um, they can see, uh, they or their coaches, can see how it's set up and, and get an idea. And then they can always contact us and Courtney can talk to them through FaceTime or messenger or, or WhatsApp or, you know, whatever he needs a uh, video and help them. Uh, Personal question. <laughs> the first time you shot the bow and you realized that you hit the target, I know that there's a, there's a sound that comes with it. <laughs> <laughs> what did it feel like? success, you know, successful. And, um, like a kind of a camaraderie with the other archers there on the, on the range, you know, I did what they, what they do, you know, and the thing about this tactile sighting technique is once it's, um, set up, you know, on the shooting line, you know, once you're, once you're lined up, it's totally up to you to perform that shot. I can adjust that equipment as I need to, and but it's up to me. And so when I hit that target, you know, and when my spotter tells me that it's in the gold, you know, or sometimes if I'm practicing, I use a like an um, like a to-go box, a styrofoam, you know, either an egg container or a to-go box. And it, when I hit that styrofoam, I know that's in the center. I can hear it. And, you know, and so I get instant, you know, and it's like, yeah, you know, I, I did that. That was me. That wasn't somebody saying no, a little bit to the left. No, no, no. Aim a little to the right. You know, it wasn't that it was, it was me. I performed that shot. And when I do the, do it wrong, you know, when I'm, when I'm missing all the time, it's like, okay, you got to figure this out. This is you. It's something you're doing. And it's not, a, it's not a team sport. It's not a team effort. It's, it's me once the equipment's set up. And I like that, you know, I like that idea. And I like that idea for as far as rehabilitation purposes. And I like the idea as far as people who are observing, you know, they can't, they can't say that I, that I'm, uh, you know, that it takes, other people to make that work for me you know they can see that's me doing that how long have you been serving on the board of directors at society for the blind and just a simple question what have you learned about yourself uh during that experience i've been on the board of directors since 2013 and um I, and I've, I've been the secretary and I've been vice president and president, and now I am past president. 
um, you know, when I was, it was very interesting. The whole experience has been a, a an amazing, <laughs> amazing opportunity. Um, when I was contacted by one of the board members in 2013 and asked if I would consider joining the board and um, Sherry and one of the uh, um, uh, learning uh, independent living skills instructors came to the house. And I, I was thinking of it as a kind of an interview. Um, and so you're always kind of nervous, you know, uh, for an interview, of course. And um, as I, as we sat down and chatted, I realized this wasn't an interview. They were recruiting me, you know, and I thought that was an amazing, I had never been recruited before, you know, and here are these professional people and, you know, and Sherry, you know, um, and I'm thinking they're, yeah, they're, they're trying to sell me on being on the board, not trying to figure out if I should be on the board. And I, I just, I thought that was, that was just an amazing experience for me. That something that I, I guess I never saw as myself as someone, you know, worth, worth recruiting um, uh, and to be on something like that. And so that was, that was an eye opener just with that, but just learning um, the, about Society for the Blind, because I only knew about it by name, and I didn't know anything else about it, and learning about it and just feeling that energy. When I, and I told Sherry that you walk into the front doors of that place, and there's just an energy that's unmistakable and such a positive, you, you're just in such a positive place, and I've always had that feeling in there never really experienced that anywhere else. Um, and I, I just, I just, um, am amazed by that. And I guess, and the, uh, the, the board itself is such a cohesive board. It's a pleasure knowing all those people and you don't have any of the, the politics or the bad vibes that, you know, can happen on boards and different organizations um, you know, and the, the personality issues, it's always been very cohesive and um, the people on the board are all um, working for the same goals and that's to, you know, make society better and how can we, what can we do to make society for the blind function, um, continue to function as well as it is doing. And under the leadership of Sherry, uh, Sherry um, is a collaborative. Everything about her involves everybody and everybody's ideas. And to to know somebody like that, an executive director who has, you know, there's no ego there. Um, you know, she's she's there there to serve and to to help people become become better. Um, better versions of themselves um, and really trying to use everybody's, um, uh, you know, what, what they do best. And, and, and that's how she is with the board. And I feel like I've been on the board now for what, uh, seven going on eight years. I, I know there's, more that I can do for society as a board member. And I know I have, a, I don't feel like I've scratched the surface. There's so many, many things that I'd like to do with society for the blind. And as a, you know, working with all of you in management and, um, you know, in the different programs. And I, I, I really would like to help more. Um, and so I, I feel like it's, it's a, it's a great, place to be um you learn about about yourself and you learn about working with other people and um and i um that's yeah that's it there's there's so much more even though it sounds like i've been on the board for a long time i feel like i haven't scratched the surface yet of what what my potential is to bring to society for the blind and of course COVID didn't help <laughs> Would it be fair to say that it's been an inspirational experience? It has definitely. It has definitely um, 
uh, yes. And being that I haven't spent, you know, in my, in my growing up life, haven't spent a lot of time around agencies for the blind because I was mainstreamed, you know, and I used to say, you know, places like, like I used to maybe think in my early years, places like that teach you how to be blind. That was my, and see, and it kind of goes back, I think, Randy, to what we talked about, where all growing up, I tried to be, to fit into the sighted world. And I thought that was important. I don't want to be different. So I really didn't want to go to be part of a place like Society for the Blind, uh, per, per se, because it seemed like you were isolating yourself and they were going to teach you how to be blind when I didn't want to be blind. I wanted to be like everybody else. So yes, I mean, totally, totally different um, society for the blind is than that image that I grew up with. If it's okay, I'm going to ask you one more question. And, mm-hmm. and, and I, and I really, really, Janice, I enjoyed talking to you. I could relate so much to what you've talked about. Um, Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Um, how, going back to your parents, and, and, and I see this, I've kind of experienced this, you know, as part of my job, but having that support, having those high expectations early in life, do you think that helped make you who you are today? Yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at, how my parents dealt with having two blind children, which was, you know, not at all in their experience, level of experience, you know, uh, and my brothers and sister as well. Um, but it's definitely my, my upbringing that I was never, I was never told that I couldn't do something because I was blind. I was never made to feel like something that I, that I wanted to do um, was, was beyond me. Um, yes, if it was something that, that my parents didn't think was right to do, of course, I was told no, but not sure. any different being blind or, or not. When I was young, I was still in elementary school and I told my mom I wanted to be, when I grew up, I wanted to be a brain surgeon. Well, she she laughed, but she wasn't laughing at me. And she never said, "Oh, that's ridiculous, Janice." You know, you can't. You can, how could you ever be a, a a brain surgeon? She didn't. You know, and I was I was never told that that there was anything that would be impossible for me to do um, if I wanted. And I'm not saying I had high ambitions, you know, as a child. Um, but I was, uh, the brain surgery thing was cause I, I just loved the medical field. Um, you know, um, but, but uh, yeah, I was never made to feel that there were limitations on me. And, um, you know, if there was something I wanted to do, they, they helped me figure out how, you know, how, how to go about doing it. And that's the same with my, uh, low vision instructor that I had all the way from kindergarten through um, 12th grade, the same low vision instructor. And she she was the same way, very innovative, and she never never made me feel like I had limitations, ever. Um, any limitations were just were things I put on myself. Um, and so, um, yeah, without a supportive family like that and an environment, you know, to, to live in, uh, I would have, would have been quite different. <laughs>